um, opportunity for people to get seated. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Okay, well, I'd like to call this meeting to order. The time is now uh, 9.45 and a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Ed meeting of March 9, 2010 is called to order. Um, I apologize, I'm probably the one that caused this to be a little bit late. We had a very full cabinet meeting this morning that um, went over just a little bit. And I always tend to clarify this just because we have new audience members. I, uh, I report to the State Board, as you know, not the Governor, but she's kind enough to invite me to Cabinet meetings and hope that'll be the case next year when there's another Governor, because it's helpful mm -hmm. to be in the room. Um, so let's go to our next item, which is approval of agenda and order of priority. Um, I move so approval. Moved Support. by John, supported by Kath. <coughs> Any discussion or changes? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Uh, Eileen, if you do your thing. I will. We have a lot of guests here today. And <coughs> I do. appreciate their attendance. Sorry I didn't get a chance to greet some of you directly. I'll first introduce the board members and then department staff and then our r regular attendees that are here with us today. At the head of the table and chairman of the State Board of Education is Mr. Mike Flanagan, superintendent of public instruction. Next to Mr. Flanagan is Mrs. Kathleen Strauss from Detroit, President of the Board. Moving around the table is Mr. John Austin from Ann Arbor. He is the Board's Vice President. Uh, next is Mrs. Carolyn Curtin from Everett, Secretary. Uh, joining us on the telephone today is Marianne Yard McGuire from Detroit. Good morning. Um, she's Good the Board's morning. Treasurer. Uh, next is Naya Harden representing Governor Granholm at the Board table. The next empty chair is that of Mr. Rob Stevenson, the 2009-10 Michigan Teacher of the Year. And Rob is not with us today. Uh, he is interviewing for National Teacher of the Year. Uh, the interview started yesterday and it continues today. So He's one of right. four finalists. One of four so finalists. <coughs> in the hunt. Oh. Mm -hmm. Moving across the table is Ms. Cassandra Albrich from Rochester Hills. Next is Mr. Reginald Turner from Detroit. Next is Mrs. Elizabeth Bauer from Birmingham. And uh, the empty chair next to me is uh, that <coughs> Nancy Danhoff from East Lansing. Nancy is the board's delegate to the National Association of State Boards of Education. And Nancy will probably be joining us via the telephone a little bit later. Department of Education staff, uh, Sally Vaughn, Chief Academic Officer and Deputy Superintendent, Carol Wallenberg, Deputy Superintendent, Martin Ackley, Director of Communications, Andrea Post, Administrative Aide to the Superintendent, and Lisa Hansconnect, Legislative Director. I think all the rest of the department staff must be watching on their computers today. Uh, some organizational representatives joining us today. Diane McMillan, representing the Michigan Association of Secondary School Principals. David Borth, Network of Michigan Educators. Bruce Fay, Wayne Risa. David Michelson uh, from the Michigan Education Association. And Iris Salters is also here today, and she will be one of our presenters a little bit later. Lois Lofton Donover from the AFT Michigan, and David Hecker is here as well, who will be presenting later. Uh, Pat McNeil, Michigan Association for Curriculum and Staff Development. Judy Pritchett, Macomb Intermediate School District. Dan Quisenberry, Michigan Association of Public School Academies. Barbara Stork, Michigan Association of Non-Public Schools. And Billy Wimmer, Michigan Council of Charter School Authorizers. We might as well. Heck, it's not often. There's our future. There's why we're all here, ladies and oh, gentlemen. Yeah. I don't even know whose kid that is, but we're going to. Who is that, Bob? This is Kim Kowalczyk's newest. He's two months old. Oh, great. Oh. Welcome. Good. <laughs> the earliest good. attender of a state board meeting in history. What a distinction. Yeah. I think I'll be the oldest at some point. We've got a long way to go. Oh, what? <laughs> Um, I, just before I turn this over to our president, I thought I'd mention that, you know, obviously somewhat the elephant in the room is the race to the top uh, stuff that came out last week. And, and, you know, I was out for a few days hoping to get uh, a little bit of rest. Turns out we were on the phone and doing radio and other things for a couple of days, um, Thursday and Friday. But I would say this, that we're really optimistic that we're going to get um, 
constructive feedback, and with that constructive feedback, we're going to attack our weak points and uh, do well in the second, or possibly there's even going to be a third round. <clears throat> we, we don't know yet. There's been a lot of speculation in the press. I've even speculated myself a little bit based on some national articles about what folks think is uh, maybe our weakest point. But what we're going to do is probably April 1 or so is the time that we're going to get more direct feedback. And that's because they want to let the process of these first uh, s selected folks go through it to completion before they actually then say, hey, here's the other states and here's, here's what the point distribution looked like. And my understanding is it was everything above, I think, 400 points, if I have that right. So are we 399 or are we 299? I, we don't know yet. And I think as a community <coughs> interested in, in our kids in this state, we're just all going to have to work together um, to make sure that we, we deal with those weak areas that may be identified. If we're only a few points out, maybe there aren't many weak areas. Um, some national press has talked about some legislative issues that we probably need to address. There's some issues apparently related to uh, that other states were, that were awarded that are related to the, the word significance in uh, legislation that talks about teacher evaluations. Um, we'll see if that's actually par for the course or not, but it does seem there's a parallel there to some degree, but that could be just one factor and it might be a small one. Um, I do think there's going to be an opportunity for us to get together and work that out. Um, I meet with the Ed Alliance every month, and, and uh, it's, it's a group that's made up of all the educational leaders. And uh, what we do as recently as yesterday is, is, at least for months now, I've listened and responded to and taken input back from that group on our Race to the Top application, and that's got everyone <laughs> from teacher associations and school boards to Dan, I see over there, the Charter School Association, and it's been very helpful. And then there's formal structures of stakeholders and all that have been involved in our process. But uh, for me personally, that's been the one that's worked the best, where every month, uh, I think it's fair to say, I kind of just sit there and sometimes take it, you know, if that's what it means. Dan's chairman this year. I happen to be chairman before this job. I was chairman for a year. and. It's really, uh, from my perspective, my singular perspective as superintendent, it's a way to really understand the pulse of what the education community feels is important. And, um, and it's been very helpful. And we'll continue to work with them to try to improve our uh, application. So keep our heads up. I, I you know, started tweeting this year because my daughter thought it would be cool. She's a teacher, a high school teacher, a very good one. And um, I tweeted. Thursday night, I think it was, out of town, and I think I said something like, hey, if you look at American Idol, the people that don't look like they're going to win those first couple of nights often are the ones that are there when it's at the final stage. So hopefully we're going to cross the line and be able to do that. One way or the other, um, I respect this board for really starting the discussion on some of the legislative issues that needed to be changed that turned out to be school reform on the academic side. Um, just as a reminder to folks in the audience and others that that, that culminated, I think, kind of with um, Senator Kuypers and Representative Melton being here and hearing the board's issues related to those reforms. Uh, compliment them for getting those through because one way or the other, that's changed our state forever. Mm -hmm. Those reforms, whether we get the money or not, have made a, uh, an indelible imprint on our state for the positive. We probably all don't, including myself, agree with every aspect of every one of those reforms, but I think on whole it's a very, very important statement about student academic achievement being the centerpiece of what we should be all about. And then finally, I guess I'll just move to today's before I give it to uh, our president, and that is that I, I, you know, as a team yesterday, I, we, we talked about how proud we are of the board taking this initiative today that they've had for a few months now and trying to provide leadership, as I think they've done on everything from high school requirements to the reforms I just mentioned that were signed into law in January, and now um, also on this important thing related to really the three R's as we think about them. It's reform, uh, reductions, and revenue. And so it's, it's, it's been great to see the folks that come in and have testified and given us a lot of insight, and there are more to come today. 
and then I think the board's goal is to try to get some recommendations together for the legislature by our next meeting or so and it's with that I'd like to turn it over to our president Kathleen Strauss well thank you Mike well Mike has already said that we've been doing this now for several months because we recognize that we're the state is in difficulty and we have to we feel we have a role in a responsibility to try to help us get out of it and to solve the problems what we've done is we've had a present and we've had presentations by economists from the left the right the center uh, from various groups from educators from the uh, from SOS which represents the, uh, the the school organizations public schools administrators boards principals others charter schools uh, and, and we've had presentations from various groups with their ideas of what should be done to solve the problem. And today we're going to hear from uh, some more people. We'll have representatives of business and labor and, uh, and more school folks and uh, the Center for Michigan. We're leading off today with the Center for Michigan. Phil Power was, all, was here, what, I think, at our first session. And uh, today we're going to hear from John Bebo. The Center for Michigan, well, he'll explain it too, but uh, is trying to come up with a, quote, a recipe for solving the problem as we are. And what we're hoping to do is bring all of this together and with our bipartisan board, come up with a recommendations for the governor and the legislature, as we did with the, uh, with the high school requirements and with the, uh, high with the school reform. We've done everything, just about everything, unanimously. And when we don't, it's not by party. We have people on both sides of, it, of an issue. But almost all of these recommendations, in fact, these big recommendations have all been unanimous and bipartisan. So we're trying to set an example for the legislature, <laughs> hopefully. So this morning, we're going to start off with John Bebo, Executive Director of the Center for Michigan. And we welcome you to the table. It's good to have you here, John. Good morning. It's it's good to be here. I probably won't be able to wow you as much as the two two month old baby did, but uh, I'll certainly <laughs> give it like my best baby. shot. Thanks for having me here today. My name is John Bebo. I'm executive director of the Center for Michigan. Over the past 30 months, the center hosted 500 community conversations involving more than 10,000 people in every corner of the state. The purpose was to help educate everyday citizens about the challenges facing Michigan, gather their concerns, and develop a common ground citizen's agenda for Michigan's future. In those many hours of deliberation, citizens outlined numerous action steps regarding education. I'd like to go over just a few of them for you. First, they want you to continue to stress a curriculum that links education to the jobs of the new economy. Citizens ask that you focus on the basics of reading, writing, and math, but they also want a creative learning environment where educators do not teach to standardized tests. And they want educators to clearly illustrate to students the relevance between class lessons and the outside world. Secondly, citizens are hungry for a sustainable <coughs> school funding system you have the support of the public out there in trying to reach these solutions. And we think there's a grand bargain to be had. The center has hosted a variety of large policy forums with a lot of experts. In November, we focused strictly on state budget finance. And the consensus out of that meeting was clear. There is a grand bargain to be had. It deals with sustainable revenues gotten to through a reworked tax system, not add-ons, little additions here or there or changes, but reworking the whole tax system to make it more competitive in the 21st century and make it fund the priorities that we have going forward. In return, there will have to be a pound of flesh. There will have to be reforms. Citizens are concerned with legacy costs, the cost of government, the number of school districts, the size and scope of those issues. 
and also the priorities in the state budget. When we are spending almost a quarter of our general fund on prisons, it doesn't leave much left over for some of the priorities we're talking about here today. A third priority we've heard from the citizens is to fully recognize the importance of pre-K education. Fourth, assure that all students succeed. You've already worked very hard on, on dropout issues and they're very concerned that you, con that you continue to do so. Fifth, intensify educator accountability through training and development and consideration of tenure reform and consideration of, of new models for how we reward our best performing teachers. Six, intensify school district collaboration and consolidation. And finally, expand teaching and learning through a longer school year and a longer school day. On that last point, I'd like to remind you of the center's school days report that we issued exactly a year ago this month. The report indicated, and we used your data for this, uh, the report indicated that in the 2007-2008 school year, more than 40 percent of Michigan's public school districts offered fewer than 170 days of instruction. You responded quickly to that report and requested reform from the legislature. They didn't exactly go all the way to meet your concerns. The legislature passed rules requiring that districts return to at least 165 days of instruction in the 2010-2011 school year if it does not violate labor contracts and at least 170 days in 2012-2013. Is that really good enough? Over the course of a 13-year education, a student in a 165-day district would go to school a year less than one in a 180-day district. Mm -hmm. This issue is not going away. The Atlanta, Michigan School District went to a four-day week earlier this year and the front page of the Wall Street Journal yesterday had the headline, School's New Math, the four-day week. About dozens of districts trying this around the country. Not all of them are doing it for budget reasons. None of them are doing it to provide better education to our kids. Finally, we hope the, state's, the State Board's long-term education policy and finance recommendations fully outline the fiscal and policy impacts of declining K-12 enrollment in Michigan. If the projections are accurate, school populations will decrease by 15 percent or about 250,000 students from 2003 to 2017. Will that decrease result in potential cost savings? Surely it's not as simple as tr subtracting per pupil funding for a quarter million lost students from the school aid fund. But that calculation comes to nearly $3 billion. As we lose students, will more bus routes and schools and districts operate under capacity? Does this increase the pressure for school district collaboration and consolidation? We hope the State's Board's policy recommendations address these questions and the Center will address them further at a jam-packed town hall meeting on education at Eagle Eye Golf Club tomorrow in East Lansing. Speakers include Mike Flanagan, State Representative Tim Melton, MSU President Luana K. Simon, and numerous other educators and students. And they've been asked to focus on the topic of education innovation in coming years. We'll stop pour start pouring coffee a little before 8 o'clock. We'll have you out of there with a sandwich by noon. We hope you can join us. Thank you. Thank you, John. I think the board wanted to interact for a bit with each individual. So are there uh, questions or comments for <coughs> please. John? And I, I think uh, several of the other headliners <coughs> are, uh, tomorrow are here today. D David Hecker. That's true. And, uh, I think, uh, David I Hecker, Dan Quinn, Barry Walsh, and Speaking. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big production, a really big show. So <laughs> um, thank you, John. You talked about a, um, a grand bargain that there needs to be a, sort of a compromise balancing um, uh, pain or a pound of flesh or some you know, serious reforms, which you mentioned, along with some changes in the revenue side. There are those, as you know, who are saying we can do this through um, cuts only or through reform only, um, that we can cut uh, prison c budgets or we can find cost savings in education. Uh, what's your all's analysis of whether we can or should have a sort of reform side or cut side only? 
approach. We would leave the nitty gritty of that to the House and Senate fiscal agencies. Um, Mitch Bean makes an awfully compelling uh, presentation about what has happened to the state budget revenues in the past few years. And I think there is a question of how deep, how much deeper we can go. But at the same time, uh, the center as well as the business organizations across the state have listed hundreds of millions of dollars in reforms that could still be made that haven't been made, including some in education. Other board members? Yeah, please, I, please. I was pleased to hear that among all the parties you've talked with, you mentioned students. Mm -hmm. Because frankly, I think they are the customer of our <coughs> enterprise, and if we're not listening to the customer, we may be designing the wrong model that uh, will not be embraced by learners in the future coming forward. I, I really, um, I feel very, very strongly that we need to start early, like early childhood. You did mention that, but also integrate technology more <coughs> as a means of instruction. That, that you know teaching with and through the technology that children already own and use every day. Um, I think we have um, work to do along that. With all those R's, you know, the reading, writing, arithmetic, reforms, renewal, and reduction, I think, I think the word renewal is in, important. I think we need to think about building a system, not just, you know, massaging it or cutting out some parts or, or squeezing two parts or four more together, but wh what is it that our, our uh, children want and need to know to be global uh, citizens. I mean, we have to look at that. And then how can we support that, them to get that learning? And it may, we may find that buildings and structures and things are taking a back seat. We don't need all of this stuff that we have. And uh, we might have a ec more economic kind of whole child approach to, uh, uh, to, to the future. We'd add the voice of the teachers to that, as, as well as yeah. the students. Uh, and David Hecker will be, yeah. will be pre right. presenting tomorrow. That's exactly why we're going to focus tomorrow on innovation going forward. Uh, it, it would be easy to do a session that focused solely on the never-ending drumbeat of dwindling revenues that <laughs> we're all a little tired of. Well, we, we, you know, people all over the world are, are doing stuff great educational enterprises without all the things that we feel in America are necessary to our enterprise. <coughs> and that's why I say if we could back up to the customer and what is it that they need, you know, to, to read so they can look it up, so they can inquire and discover and be explorers in, in uh, learning. I mean, that doesn't take a lot of stuff. Thank you, John. Yeah. Reggie, uh, please. And you you look uh, different. It just hit me what it is. And, you know, I grew a little more hair, no, and, you, and the, you took yours right. off, didn't you? This is true. Yeah. Um, <laughs> for the first time since the Peach Fuzz came in when I was 14. Really? Wow. wow. Yeah. Well, Are you renewed before? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, I uh, just made a mistake with my razor, so I'm sad. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a grand bargain oh, with the no family. Or there, was, there was no plan. Um, <laughs> It's interesting. I've been looking at your Reggie, thinking he looks different today. <laughs> yeah, 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 no. Uh, John, uh, I don't know how I segue from that <laughs> question, but I, I have to um, really appreciate the work that the Center for Michigan has been doing um, over the course of the last few years. I think that you've helped to move this discussion along, and some of the points that you started making when you set the center up and, and set forth your agenda, you know, have kind of, I think, become uh, more broadly accepted, that we have to start working together, that we have to give deeper thought to some of the issues that um, traditionally have divided us without um, w without the partisanship that, um, that seems to create such gridlock. But you talked about consensus on a variety of, um, of points. Um, <coughs> One of the things that I'm hoping I in this discussion that we can develop a consensus around is the fact that, uh, or the, the, the aspiration um, for Michigan that a child's um, quality of education and the amount spent on that education should not be dependent upon where the child lives. Um, 
that we should seek equity in education funding. And uh, proposal A was was an, an incremental step in that direction, but fell far short of the of the goal. Do you sense um, in in your discussions and your reviews, your polling, surveying that that there is some some support for equity in education funding in our state? There is support for um, a, a broader concept of equity. When we're out there talking to citizens, we do it for about two hours at a stretch, and they they talk with us at kind of the menu level of discussion about their state rather than the recipe level. But in terms of equity, and we don't get down into nitty-gritty details about this school district getting more money than that. It, 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 it there isn't enough time, and, and they're not as uh, they're not as wonky as we are <laughs> about that. But I can say that we heard over and over again the concept from people in Monroe or Howell or Marquette that to move Michigan forward, it has to move forward with our great older cities as well. That it, that floored me, being from a small town near Lansing. And having worked in journalism, um, and, and having reported on the great rifts that we have in this society, it, it floored me to hear people in the suburbs and in the country recognize that we've got to help our troubled cities as well. And they did do that. Thank you, Reggie. Any uh, Carolyn, please. Um, ever the pragmatic person is me, <laughs> so. I agree with Liz that we need to um, have a discussion, dialogue with students. But when I think about, and I feel really strongly, that we need an expanded school year. Our kids cannot compete with schools in um, <coughs> Europe and Asia who have a much longer period of time. Um, I worry greatly, my own school district is on trimesters. In my mind, I don't know how you can give a whole year's worth in two trimesters. So that troubles me. But I think we don't want to ask the kids about an uh, extended school year because there wouldn't be <laughs> one in junior high on up that would say, oh, yeah, I want to go to school 10 months or whatever. So I think that needs to be the adult decision. <laughs> we, we, uh, we do this little newsletter that I think some of you subscribe to. It's called Fresh Thoughts. It comes out via email every week. Um, we try to delve deeply into some of these issues. Rob Stevenson was featured in last week's newsletter. Uh, we've also profiled some of the districts, that, there's only a handful, but some of the districts that are experimenting around the state with year-round schools. Uh, I'd be glad to provide the board with, with copies of those stories. Um, those programs are getting very strong reviews in those communities where they, are, where they are happening, where those communities are being creative enough to be able to launch those. Thank you. Kath, please. Well, that's interesting because we, there have been school districts in the past, that schools that have gone on year-round programs, and then they reverted back to the traditional school year. So I'm glad to know that there are some <coughs> that <coughs> like it because it seems like a good idea to me. And I, I didn't know why people rejected it, but they did. So. so. Well, to get longer, I, we got to keep from going shorter, and, and we would strongly encourage the board to keep pushing in those budget right. committees to strengthen those those day requirements. Okay. Well, thanks very much, thanks, John. That, it's been very helpful. Thank you. I participate. I, as I mentioned to you before, I participated in one of those community conversations in a larger, in a small setting and in a larger setting. And it, it was quite interesting to hear people's views, people that I thought I knew what they were going to say, didn't always say what I thought they were going to say. So it's, it's very good to hear what people think and students what they think. It's great, John. And I, I think you may know two of our kids conducted forums, one with uh, a business community and then one of our sons uh, with college and high school kids. And they were as excited to kind of learn how to conduct those things and get the, uh, get the feedback they got. Mm -hmm. So thank you for doing this. It's really making a difference in our state. Appreciate it, John. Thank, thank you. you very much. And thanks for all the work you're doing. We are hoping that all of this is going to come together with some valuable recommendations. Uh, that you teed me up. The final report will be coming out in May, uh, just in time for the candidates to file for office and receive it in their mailboxes. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> good. Thank you.
By the way, I didn't. Um, can I ask a question oh. before Jen goes? Uh, Sorry, I didn't not. see your hand, Marianne. I was go ahead. Go and talk to that baby, but. Uh... <laughs> yeah, please, Marianne. I'm, I'm, I'm doing my part to further uh, the interest of sign language, but it's not going too far, I guess. Um, <laughs> Uh, you mentioned, uh, John, well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to come, especially uh, be before your conference. Uh, and I, I don't want you to have to trump what you're going to be doing, but you mentioned uh, cuts to education. And uh, I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit. It seems like everybody has just pretty much cut themselves to the bone at this point, and uh, I'm wondering what else could uh, possibly be there to cut. Um, Marianne, one thing we will do is, is publish an issue guide tomorrow that everybody will take away, and it, it, it's produced by the Center in cooperation with public sector consultants, and we, we borrow data from lots of people to put that out. It will lay out some of the school funding issues. Um, going forward, I, I think some of the reform discussions might not revolve so much around cuts as, as maybe a different word, efficiencies. I think, um, uh, especially in the business community, there's support for the idea that the superintendent might have more leverage to uh, encourage or require consolidation of services at the ISD level. Um, that might be one, one way to go. And I think there's ongoing discussion, and, and maybe David Hecker will speak to this as well, about the issue of legacy costs and, and how we're going to deal with those when I think 30% of payroll will be going to the pension and benefits issues in just a few years. And there's a question about how we're going to be able to sustain that. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thanks so much for Thank your. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, one thing I meant to mention about cabinet this morning, you could, they made a point that I'm going to be the only one there a year from now. And, you know, I don't, as I said, I don't know whether I'll be invited to the cabinet or not, but it's interesting that, um, I'm going to save this for when school picks back. It's not worth wasting. It's about, it's going to, it's going to be a little jab, jab at him. So let me hold off on that while he's waiting. Does he think um, he's going to come back? He may not come back. <laughs> and there may not be an appropriate time anyway. They will learn the rest of the story, though. <laughs> right, they will learn the rest. I think our next guest yes. who will be introduced by Kath yeah. is Dave Hecker. Well, we wanted to, we had SOS here last a uh, few weeks ago, uh, and they represent SOS represents all of the other uh, the school administrators and the boards and the management side. We wanted to make sure that that the teachers and workers in the schools are represented. And, and we know that they have good ideas about what we should do to solve our problems. We all agree that we can t all children can learn, and we believe that. We believe that very strongly, and we want to make sure that all children have the opportunity to learn in good, high-quality schools. And no one believes that more than the teachers. They really want their kids to succeed. So we're delighted that today we have with us both David Hecker, president of the American Federation of Teachers in Michigan, and, Lo and Iris Salters, uh, president of the MEA. So David's on first, and uh, we're delighted to welcome you here, David, and uh, look forward to hearing what you Good morning. have ideas. Uh, and it's, it's delightful to be here. Uh, I appreciate the invitation. I appreciate that the board wanted to hear from Iris and myself and the uh, perspectives of AFT Michigan and the Michigan uh, Education Association. As, as we all know and, and we, we all agree, uh, the bottom line is children and adults who are students having access to high quality education, an education that enhances achievement and produces a well-rounded individual for the world and all that it brings. Before I get into some specifics, let me say that uh, what we need to do to further enhance the education of our children cannot be achieved solely within the four walls of a schoolhouse or the bordering streets of a college campus. I know union critics label a statement like this as a cop-out. I label it reality. 
Let me also make it clear that we are not against meaningful reform. We proposed it many times. The key word here is meaningful, not the latest fad, not the idea that grabs a headline. So concerning the issues uh, that we are to discuss today, education, funding, restructuring, and reform, I'm not going to go over the financial numbers. We all know them. Uh, but I will say what the numbers mean, because I don't think everyone understands that, or they pretend not to understand it, or they understand, but they don't really care. Funding cuts as costs and mandates increase mean fewer programs, less services, larger classes, unclean schools, and very understandably, people saying, do I really want to go into or stay in education? And this means that in, quite, in spite of the incredible work of school employees, students get screwed. Forgive my bluntness, but that's exactly what happens. <laughs> and it isn't just that programs are cut. Much needed programs aren't implemented. As John talked about, uh, what the people wanted, what the people want is what research tells us, the importance of early childhood education. My children received it because we paid for them to go to preschool. By not properly funding early childhood education, our state is saying to too many families who cannot pay that your child really does not matter. This state doesn't even mandate kindergarten. And with an increasingly smaller proportion of the state budget spent on community colleges and higher education, access is reduced as tuition is increased to cover costs. As you know, the Promise Grant was dropped. State funding for work-study programs was eliminated. Financial aid for students agreeing to pursue nursing careers, a crying need in our hospitals, was dropped. Is more funding sufficient to address the shortcomings of our education system? Of course not. Is more funding necessary to address the deficiencies of our education system? Absolutely. So those who say that schools should just cut spending, that stabilize funding, or can we even dream an increase in funding, is not necessary, have an agenda that really has little to do with education. Those who say just cut spending, first of all, talk like cuts are not being made. Believe me, it happens each and every day at the bargaining table. Moreover, smart ideas for saving money are oftentimes talked through. For example, through collective bargaining, we consistently propose ways to save on health care. And I have to tell you, oftentimes we have to fight with the administration of the school district to accept them. Some have proposed legislation to mandate public employees pay 20 percent of health care and take a 5 percent pay cut. There is legislation that mandates school districts and other units of government choose their health plans from a limited state-created set of options. There are proposals to undermine state and school employees' retirement benefits. We hear that by spending money on benefits, pay, retirement, well, that is money that just does not go into the classroom. But when I was in school, I was not taught by my desk, the blackboard, or the American flag in the corner. A teacher taught me. The most important determinant of a quality education is the quality of the teacher in the classroom. You pay for quality. We have legislation to mandate the privatization of school support services. The thought is districts can save money by doing this. Sometimes they will, oftentimes they won't. With privatization, school employees who have done so much for the children, from teaching them to read, getting them to school, providing them with lunch, may or may not be hired by the private company. And even if they are hired by the private company, we are creating families who can provide less for their children, who, by the way, are our students. Therefore, creating students who will now be coming to school with all of the disadvantages low-income children bring. Poorer nutrition, parents working multiple jobs and not home, and no access to all the advantages my children have. We need revenue. AFT Michigan supports the plan of a better Michigan future. We have long called for a significant restructuring of our taxation system which is based, as you know, on an outdated model that has an overemphasis on goods and an underemphasis on services. The two major revenue changes we recommend extend the 6% sales tax to services and institute a graduated income tax. Regarding the service tax, even if, if you exclude business-to-business -business taxes, health care, and nonprofit organizations, the state would still realize $1.65 billion more in annual revenue. It is absurd that you buy a winter coat for your daughter and pay sales tax, which you should, 
while the golfer at the country club does not pay sales tax. Just one example. A graduated income tax would actually reduce the tax burden of 90% of Michigan citizens and still raise over a half a billion dollars. Seven states out of 50 are left with a flat tax. Long ago, we discovered the world is not flat. It is time to realize the flat tax is not fair and is not the answer. It is not about getting reelected when it comes to the tax issue. It's about providing for Michigan's future. In addition to enhancing funding, we need to figure out how best for the state to allocate the funds. We have to properly deal with declining enrollment districts, not just in a token manner. We have to realize that education, edu educating a child costs more in some districts than others, and I'm not referring to differences in collective bargaining agreements. We have to figure out how to deal with the fact that my children have come home to everything they could possibly need to support their education. Many children do not. It just doesn't happen within the four walls. There is much talk about restructuring our education system, sharing of services, consolidation. There's already a great deal of sharing of services. I know our Lacia No District shares a superintendent with Detour. I know there's consolidation of purchasing to get a better price throughout the state. Can there be more of this? My guess is yes. On consolidation of districts, two points. One, how much would it really save? And two, how does it impact communities and their involvement with their schools? If two or more districts combine, we still need the teacher in the classroom, the secretary running the school, the custodian cleaning it, and the engineer heating it. Later, I'll talk a little bit about community schools. The support and involvement of the community with our schools is essential. These districts are tight communities. My family lives in Huntington Woods and joins with North Oak Park and Berkeley to form the Berkeley School District. What would happen if all of Oak Park and Ferndale and Pleasant Ridge all combined with the Berkeley District? Those are great communities, but I still think a great deal would be lost. We are concerned that if districts combine, community involvement and support will be harder to achieve. And we need to be very careful about top-down consolidation. Forcing it on communities is a recipe for disaster. Once allocated to districts, we need to spend the money wisely. We need to spend the funds to positively impact instruction to increase student learning. We need to implement research-based reforms, not the latest fad. As John uh, mentioned, the people want. We need universal early childhood education. We need early intervention for struggling students. Smaller classes, smaller schools, not that some large schools do not work fine. Schools as community centers, centers that provide students and their families with important services, centers that bring the parents and the community into our schools. We need a quality teacher in every classroom, a well-rounded curriculum, a limit on standardized testing, as John mentioned, and therefore not forcing teachers to teach to the test. We need to actually fund mentoring programs. It's a concept. You pass a program, you fund it. Uh, we need collaborative shared decision-making. And as our national president, Randy Weingarten, has stated, we all need to view collective bargaining as not only a vehicle to protect worker rights and workplace fairness, but also as a vehicle for both sides to improve teacher and staff quality, ensure school improvement, and establish rigorous academic standards. I think many of you are probably familiar with the recent settlement we reached with the Teachers, Un teachers Union and DPS at Detroit Public Schools. I think that contract is a great example of that instituting peer review and assistance, jointly developed and implemented professional development, school leadership teams, a school-wide <laughs> bonus program, priority schools. The key is this was negotiated, was not implemented top-down. That is the key. We need meaningful professional development, as we'll have in Detroit, implemented jointly with employees and their unions. We need evaluate, evaluation systems that are not I gotcha systems but constructive evaluation and development systems that help teachers and staff improve and develop. Randy Weingarten has proposed rigorous reviews by trained expert and peer educators and principals. The goal is to lift whole schools and systems, to help promising teachers improve, good teachers to become great, and to identify those teachers who just shouldn't be in the classroom. We need an Okemos High School infrastructure for every student not just those of the economic status of many Okemos families. And we need administrators to do their jobs. There should never be a case where an ineffective teacher is granted tenure because the administrator messed up the process. 
Never let an ineffective tenure teacher who has been provided assistance, support, and time to improve, and is no better as a result, never let that person continue to teach. Con counsel the teacher out of the profession. If the teacher will not go, build the case, follow the process, and fire ineffective teachers. Please, to those who say the process is too long, hire more administrative law judges to hear tenure cases. We do not need proposed silver bullets for funding, restructuring, or reform. In her new book, John had some show and tell, I have some show and tell. In her new book, in which she reverses her long-held beliefs on education, the subtitle is actually How Testing and Choice Are Undermining Education. In her new book, Diane Ravitch writes, quote, school reformers sometimes resemble Dumbo, her comparison, not mine. They are convinced they could fly if they only had a magic feather. I have consistently, Diane Ravitch has consistently warned that in education there are no shortcuts, no utopias, and no silver bullets. For certain, there are no magic feathers that enable elephants to fly. We must deal with facts and not opinions. For example, we have great respect for charter school teachers and staff and want their students to receive a great education. But the facts are that while some do well, as a whole, they do no better, if as well, as traditional charter schools. Yet too many elected officials on both sides of the aisle, including our president, are blind to this reality. We know of no research that has found that merit pay enhances student learning, yet it's considered a magic bullet. So that is it, somewhat more than in a nutshell. In closing, let me thank you for this opportunity and to ask that as you develop your recommendations, you strive to do everything you can to provide meaningful and constructive support to our teachers and staff, and therefore to our bottom line, our students. The teachers like the Taylor School District's Emily Graham, who said, quote, I teach because I care. I teach because I know I make a difference. I teach because I place a high value on children and believe in my heart that it should be of the utmost priority to teach this generation how important education is. I teach because I want to change the world. I teach because it is my love, it's my passion, it's my future. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. And by the way, thank you for that bold contract that you were part of in Detroit. I think it really sets some uh, parameters for the rest of us to think about. You're welcome for that. Thank you. Reggie, please. Thanks, Mike. David, thanks for being here, and thanks for all the work that you're doing to try to improve the quality of education in the state of Michigan. I, um, I agree with Mike that the um, Detroit contract is um, groundbreaking. You know, I've been involved in state relations and education for over 20 years. I've never seen a contract that is more uh, about children and learning uh, mm -hmm. than that contract that was negotiated. And uh, Keith Johnson mm -hmm. uh, deserves a <coughs> tremendous amount of, of credit for his courage. Um, and we know he's been under attack since that contract was negotiated. And I, um, I just hope that, um, that his uh, colleagues in the union who voted two to one in favor of the contract right. um, will continue to uh, support him. He'll, uh, I know you have another comment, but he'll survive that. He'll prosper. Uh, you mentioned the vote on the <coughs> contract and, you know, the overwhelming, overwhelming majority of teachers in Detroit, uh, overwhelming, want to do what's needed even if it means some sacrifice, and uh, they'll be behind him. But. Well, it, it is uh, it's greatly appreciated, greatly appreciated. Um, I also uh, think that um, your work in individual schools, um, for example, with the United Way program, mm -hmm. where AFT Michigan is partnering with United Way to go um, uh, help promote the small school concept within Detroit mm -hmm. and, and in other school districts, um, to help to create that environment that you talked about, where kid, where people really know what's happening with the kids. Um, I think that's groundbreaking as well, and uh, I was pleased to have the opportunity to, to see that come to fruition. And work on it. A small part. <laughs> you all are doing the work. But, um, you know, one of the things that, that you, you mentioned that I think uh, people don't really understand um, in education is the power that administrators have. Mm -hmm. And um, we've had a lot of, of um, 
denigration of teachers over the course of decades. Um, but administrators do have the power to um, cause teachers who need help to get professional development. Mm -hmm. They do have the power to um, get bad teachers out of the classroom, mm -hmm. to keep them from getting tenure, or even if they have tenure, um, to document that they're not performing well over the course of a period of time and get them out of the classroom. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, too often we, we talk about, about uh, education without talking about that responsibility that administrators have um, to go into the classroom, to observe the teachers, to document uh, good performance as well as poor performance, and then act on both by recognizing those teachers who are performing uh, well and, um, and working with the teachers who aren't performing well. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I think we need to continue to, to uh, emphasize that in the work that we do going forward. And, uh, and I know David would be upset if I didn't say something about parental involvement in this conversation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I'm, I'm glad you raised that point as well. I, you know, that's an area where you know, I, I think that there really is no uh, silver bullet. Um, you know, how do you how do you get how do you motivate parents um, and create an environment in which um, in which a, a majority of parents actually feel as though they're connected to their school and to their child's education and want to be a part of, of ensuring that they're, that not only their own children, but the children of the community receive a quality education. That's a cultural thing that I think we need to continue to talk about, think about, and see what, uh, see what will work. On, on the administrative, uh, the role of administrators and what the role should be, you know, while at the end on December 19th that uh, we could not support that legislation for, for a variety of reasons, there were some things in there we liked, and, and one thing was that there now will be evaluations of, of administrators. I think we were the only state, some can correct me if I'm wrong, the only state that didn't, uh, that didn't have that. And on parental involvement, uh, the hope is that if we develop more community schools, something which I may note and, and you may remember, in your prior life, in 1992, the Coalition of Detroit Public School Unions called for, uh, that if we bring the community more into the school, it's going to help uh, with parental involvement. Mm -hmm. By the way, Reggie and his characteristic uh, unmustacheless or mustacheless <laughs> uh, modesty, he really, as David was inferring, had a lot to do with that United Way right. project Absolutely. when he was president, to say the least. Cassandra, please. Uh, well, thank you for coming You're today, welcome. David. And I wanted to say, first of all, that I appreciate the fact that you talk about the entire spectrum of education mm -hmm. from early childhood all the way to higher education mm -hmm. because we tend to look at them as different pieces but the reality mm -hmm. is they really are one cohesive mm -hmm. spectrum. Um, I just wanted to ask, you know, John talked about um, the legacy costs right. and that there are potential savings there. What is your reaction to that? Well, you know, we, uh, you know, potential savings uh, in legacy costs uh, mean reducing retirement benefits. Right. Uh, the uh, oftentimes school reform uh, is uh, the people use the word school reform and they mean, you know, cutting benefits, cutting pay, et cetera. Uh, it's reducing retirement benefits. Um, and we, we don't we don't think that's that's the answer. I mean, we think the answer the answer in this state is not a spending problem. The answer in this state <coughs> is a revenue problem. And uh, if we want to, you know, the, the goal is, you know, everyone could cite uh, uh, how many defined benefit plans uh, have gone away, uh, how many people have lost retirement. But, you know, I would hope our goal is to bring everybody up, not just to see how, fa you know, just to steal a phrase that uh, we're all kind of angered about in Michigan. Uh, it should be the race to the top, and the race to the top just isn't, you know, the, 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 the kinds of things we need to reform education. Race to the top should also mean providing for families uh, while they work in retirement. It, race to the top should also mean providing so that we can attract the best uh, and the brightest to the classroom. And we have done that. We need to continue to be able to do that. And uh, our... The, the retirement is something that people worked hard for and, and deserve. And again, it's not a spending problem in this state, it's a revenue problem. Liz, please. Okay. Um, I want to get back on the community schools piece yep. because I, 
you know, we're talking in the context of education and education funding, but if we would like fly like an elephant and look at the, <laughs> at the whole <laughs> spectrum. Do you have a feather, Elizabeth? Yeah, well, I don't know. Whatever. I don't want to be Dumbo, but whatever. Um, uh, it's rather but, racist. But I uh, think movie. about it this way. My old work was always working with children and families, so I looked at the mm -hmm. system from the bottom up, you mm -hmm. know, at federal, state, and local levels and all the intersecting parts that affect their lives. And when we budget in the state, we have mental health over here doing public health, doing their thing, and they're thinking about their clientele and building structures and programs. Corrections and juvenile justice, structures and programs. Education, structures and programs. But the user of those systems is one person. Mm -hmm. One person who has to negotiate, navigate all of those different social service, mental health things. A person can have as many as five case managers and those, and the mother, or usually the mother, but it could be the father or whatever, foster parent, has to integrate and coordinate all those systems in five locations with 99 buses and all of these things. It, I mean, it is a horrendous job. I, I can speak from my personal experience and I had resources in a car. Um, uh, we could approach budgeting from the perspective of who uses <coughs> what services and how can we locate them together to be accessible to the person and that goes right to the community school where it could be jointly funded out of different departments mm -hmm. There, you know, we add those resources, more than $13 mm -hmm. billion. Dollars. It's, it's, it's a lot of millions and billions. Mm -hmm. There's Medicaid funding. There's Medicaid recovery. Um, so that's what I mean when we start with the 1.6 million kids who come to school and the family units that support them and what are their needs. And now with surplus infrastructure all over the place, can we locate these things together mm -hmm. and we save on every department's rent? And maybe you would have more parental involvement right. because the person could be coming to the school building to get Medicaid application, food stamp application, work study, transition planning, all those things would be in one place. There, there is some, I know, and this is just an informal conversation I had with Director Ahmed of uh, Human Services. Uh, when, when he has staff in a school, and he doesn't have many for financial reasons, I mean, that, that comes from his budget. Uh, so there is some of that, but you're, but you're absolutely right. There probably we probably need to look more at that because we need to the the role of a community school obviously number one education, yeah, but it goes sure. beyond that. Yeah. So we need to figure out what budgets should feed into that. But the, this is the thing: when you have all that co-located, mm -hmm. the educator right. can be an educator right. and doesn't have That's to right. be the healthcare worker, the the, right. the nurse, the you know clothier, right. the you know, That's right. all the things that right now for in many schools they, they're and staff filling too. all these roles because mom's cross town trying to get food stamps. Mm -hmm. so. Right. Thank you, Kath. Please, then John. Well, Liz. People have said a lot of the things that uh, I have had, had in mind. I'm very glad that both John and you have mentioned early childhood education because we have really <coughs> tried to promote that for years. Years ago, we had five task forces. Of early childhood was one of them that was supposed to improve education. And we know, we know that it works. Right. And we know not that it works, but it's, it's cost effective. It saves money for the state in the long run. There was just a recent study that, that right. had the figures that showed that. So we should be pushing early childhood, it seems to me, more than, uh, rather than cutting it as being done now. So it, it's counterproductive. And the, the community schools, this is something that I've been pushing too for a long time. We've been in schools where there are health clinics and it makes such a difference to the the work of the child, the child's achievement goes up. We have we have statistics <coughs> and studies. Mm -hmm. The results show that, and it get, and as, as listed, it gets the parents in the schools. But it also would be a way of keeping some of the schools open. It seems to me that are being shut, because if we could if we could locate the health or the community, mm -hmm. the surf, social services, in that building and have funding to keep the building open, it it helps 
keeps the school, it keeps the neighborhood going, because many times when we close these schools, it affects the entire neighborhood, and it, it just declines when the school is no longer there. I had the vision of, of, of trying to have the school be the hub of the community, and now we, we're closing so many schools, there is no hub. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, if we could put the services in there, we'd keep the services and we'd keep the school. It, it, <coughs> so many of these things seem to make so much sense they seem well, so well, obvious, but we don't do it. Right. Well, we, and we, we know why we don't do it. Well, I should say we. I know why we don't do it, but I think most people know why we don't do it. We don't do it because it takes money. And people, uh, where are we? People on the other side of the Capitol are thinking about re-election. That's, that's their number one goal is to get re-elected. That's how they make their decisions. What do I need to do to get re-elected? And when enough of them have a backbone, uh, and decide to do what's right for the children and what's right for Michigan and make the tough decisions and if that means you don't get reelected, you did what's right, then we'll have it. You think it wouldn't make that much difference? They're only going to be there for six years. <laughs> I know. What are they giving up, right? It isn't like they're giving up a 30-year position. I know. It's easy. I know. Um, they all seem to go somewhere, though, that's elected. <laughs> that's that's, that's they, linked to, right, how they voted, well, right? Go they're under the table here. Um, John, I had a couple first. questions on particulars of the testimony, but first let me thank you for your leadership and your passion, and thank I would you. like to associate Welcome. myself with your argument that if you care about education, you need to be willing right. to invest in education, right. while noting that you and your union have been willing to lead on changes, reforms, even tough ones alongside them. Um, you, you and Reggie talked about <coughs> administrators doing their job. What policy or what changes can we support or what needs to happen to help administrators do their job is one and then declining enrollments you mentioned in passing and I'm not sure what is our um, what's our play relative to declining enrollment districts <coughs> in all this. Well on, on administrators doing their job uh, I think there are there are, are a few things I'll mention now and undoubtedly more if I as I drive home and get back, <laughs> to, get back to the office in Detroit. You can call in. They'll call in, right, with, with Miriam. The uh, one, uh, I think there are far, far too many situations where someone is, uh, is an excellent teacher and so we sort of want to be a principal, that's great, and automatically, okay, you, we interviewed you, et cetera, you're a principal, and they don't receive the kind of proper training they need. You know, we, we, you know, we have that in the labor movement, right? We have great, great trade unionists, and then we elect them to a position, and all of a sudden they're running, uh, you know, a $10 million budget with an organization and supervising 30 staff, and we don't train them to do that. And so we, 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 uh, we, we need to have, make sure that we provide, just because you're a great teacher doesn't mean you're a great administrator, and we need to provide that training. Uh, uh, I think the institution of, as I mentioned, the evaluation, uh, it's got to be serious evaluation. An evaluation, like I mentioned, we need for teachers and staff. It's, it's not I got you. It's evaluation to help, to help people develop and become, uh, and become better. But we also, and I, you know, I really don't know what happens. Uh, other may. You know, what, uh, what, what, what happens when, just in the one example, uh, a, uh, a principal messes up on process, on process, and that's why someone gets tenure, uh, who we would probably all agree shouldn't get tenure, but we have to defend that process or else the process is worth nothing. And that doesn't happen often, but it happens. Uh, what happens to that administrator? I, I don't know. Uh, so we, we need training. Uh, we need proper, good, strong uh, evaluations. Uh, obviously, continue training, continue professional development. It's a real skill. Mm -hmm. Administering, I think uh, people here who have that experience, and, and many of you at the table have had, it's a real, real skill. It is uh, the toughest, the toughest thing about my job. Uh, probably the thing I do worse. <laughs> and uh, so, it, you know, we need skilled people, trained people to do it. I just want Catherine. to follow, this is true in the private sector as well, right. with protection of due process rights for, for employees. Yeah. Right. Anybody. Any company, they want to, they think someone isn't performing, they have to document everything right. before they can. Right. And declining enrollment. Oh, too. declining enrollment. Well, you know, I mean, there are, uh, I mean, this, this, this is a funding issue. There are, uh, you know, when, when, when districts, uh, when there's declining enrollment, Needless to say, as we all know, it doesn't mean that 
all the families in this neighborhood over here <laughs> all, all left so we could close down that school and we need 20 less teachers uh, you know, and three less secretaries, et cetera. It's, it's people are scattered, right, throughout the district, be it a big district or a small district. Uh, and therefore, you know, the savings that a district incurs uh, because they no longer have to teach Johnny or Mary really, really is nothing, really is nothing. And uh, meanwhile, they get X thousands of dollars less because Johnny or Mary isn't there. So we just need to have proper funding so... You know, I'm not. So those districts have to be kept at a level where they receive the funding necessary to operate their district without John or Mary. And then, when the time comes, and hopefully it never comes, but if the time comes where enough people leave that district in a certain part of the community where they could actually save money because they should close that school, uh, then that could be adjusted. But we're hurting every child that remains if we don't help support that declining enrollment district when, when some kids leave. Mary Ann or Nancy, did I see a hand? No? Thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs> 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 I keep button. having phone uh, problems here. Um, uh, thank you, David, and uh, thank Welcome. you for an outstanding presentation. Thank you. Uh, and hopefully you've dispelled uh, a lot of stereotypes about teachers. Um, in the beginning, you um, you stated you wanted to hold on to the 6% uh, sales tax. And I wondered if that meant you also want to hold on to uh, Proposal A or if uh, you had any feelings one way or another on that? I mean, I... I as far um, as altering it or eliminate, eliminating it or whatever? Uh, the, I mean, I, 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 I think we seriously, as, as you're doing, we, we, which is great, uh, seriously need to look at how we fund schools. Uh, Proposal A uh, was, you know, an attempt, what was it, 16 years ago? Uh, I think Reggie said in the beginning, uh, you know, it, it addressed the funding gap a little bit, really much more so in the first couple of years when districts getting like <coughs> four grand, 4,300 a child needed to really be boosted up, up a bunch, a lot of our districts in the northern part of the state. Uh, but since those last three years really hasn't done uh, anything to close, to close the gap. And, um, <coughs> and you know, Regardless of your structure for how you allocate the money, again, there needs to be more more funding. But proposal A, you know, we could word it needs to be relooked at. We could word it uh, that it's usually the way I like to uh, approach things in general. It doesn't really matter that we put it in the drawer, we put it on the side, and we take a look at from scratch how we think schools need to be funded. Then you bring proposal A out and you say, well, if we change Article 3, Section 4, th does that do it? If, if we take a look at it by looking at proposal A, well, then you're going to be, you know, the, the four sides of the piece of paper are going to box in your thinking. So I'd just rather put it in the drawer and just think, okay, we're starting a new state. We have to fund education. H how should we go about doing it? And we need to do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank Any you. Any other questions or comments? Is it Kath, possible please, to get a Carol. copy of your presentation? Uh, yeah, I'll uh, I'll email it up to uh, your office, Mike. Sure, that'd be great. Okay, David. thank you, Carolyn, please. Um, this is Nancy. I've got my hand up too. Okay, Hi. Nancy. Huh. Hi, Nancy. It's Carolyn and then Nance. David, I thank you. I want to make sure, uh, uh, David, you said something Nancy. early on that <laughs> that um, uh, I'm certain we'll make a quote tomorrow that that the state does not have a. Uh, let, let me make sure I've got this correctly. That this that the state does not have a a uh, a spending. It's not a spending problem. It is a revenue problem. Right. I'm just wondering how you look at that in terms of um, if it's a spending pro If it's not a spending problem, would you include that? Would you include restructuring with that, or would you believe that there was a room for restructuring as well as uh, revenue? Well, there, you know, I, as, as, as I talked about in here, um, uh, there's, a, you know, there are things like sharing superintendents I know goes on. You know, can there be more of that? You know, probably. 
There's, there's a lot of, consol there's a lot of uh, consolidation of purchasing going on already. I know the ISDs do, do a great deal of that. Can there be more of that? Yes. Uh, as far as the consolidation of districts, as, as I said, you know, we have to figure out what does that save, but also balance that. And I, and I don't think it saves really that much, but uh, balance that with what I think, what we think the effect would be on community involvement uh, in schools. So uh, we, need, we need to look at various aspects of that. We know when I say it's not a spending problem, it doesn't mean that the exact way we're spending money now, there's nothing that can be changed or fixed. It's just, it's just overall, it's not a spending issue. It's a revenue issue. Okay. I must note uh, that Nancy will remember uh, that we were at an, an alliance retreat and we were going from one place to another and Nancy was kind enough to give me a ride in the car with a posthumous bumper sticker and I mentioned <laughs> it was the first time in my life I was ever in a car with a Republican bumper sticker. <laughs> 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 uh, I remember that meeting. Uh, uh, remember that, Nancy? <laughs> 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 Seem to have harmed you too much. No, it didn't harm me. <laughs> it it it, uh, it bettered me because I got to know you. <laughs> well, what a Good gentleman. Uh, uh, <laughs> Carolyn, please. David, I want to join my colleagues in thanking you for this report. You're welcome. I'm somewhat. Uh, I, f I feel better because you have such common, no nonsense ideas, and sometimes that's very lacking in what's going on. Um, I, and I would throw in, in small school districts. I think some of the problems with principals uh, evaluating fairly is that they've c if they've come from the teaching rank, they mm -hmm. have a lot of buddies and friends. Now, in a large school system, of course, that changes right. the dynamics, but I think sometimes the principals mm -hmm. don't want to be hard on their friends, mm -hmm. and they feel very isolated, and they're out of the ranks of their comrades. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a problem. I think that's uh, that's a point. The uh, you know where and as I mentioned was bargained in the Detroit contract, and we have in, uh, we're a big advocates of peer review and assistance, uh, and that's something that also has to be dealt clearly with peer review and assistance. But that's a good point, especially in the smaller communities. Okay, I know Kat's doing the introduction, so I'm going to wait till the end to just say for each person. If I I mean I've known David for years, and the five years that I was part of the Ed Alliance more directly, I still go every month. But when I was there. I just came to respect him as a, a person who is honest and caring and, uh, and bold when he needs to be, and I have a lot of trust and faith in him and appreciate you being here. Thank you, today, Mike. David. Thank you. Ditto. Okay. Thank you. Thanks Thank very you. much, David. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you very much. I appreciate your <coughs>